Okay, morning everyone. Um, so the purpose of today is to um, do a recap from what was uh, discussed on Thursday at the last workshop um, and also just to bring back some of the, um, the answers to the additional information that was requested at that workshop. Um, I'll take you through the draft messaging for the key decisions. Um, we'll give you an updated budget overview and um, I also just I've got some snippets to show you of what the long, the new long term plan document will look like um, in a designed version um, just to give you an overview of that um, as far as the way forward if um, we could do questions at the end of each section like we did at the last workshop um, there's a section break after each number of slides, um, so we'll stop the questions then. Okay, so first off is the recap um, in response to what we heard through consultation. Um, so I'll just run through um, each of the points on the it's table, on the, there's two slides and then we can go through the questions. Um, so the first one was around um, investing for resilience and growth being the right approach for Council to take at this time. Um, we're proceeding with that. Um, appropriate to change the limits for the rates, capital spending and borrowing through the long term plan proceeding. Um, the big issues that were featured in the consultation we're proceeding with. Each of the key decisions um, proceeding. So taking a bigger role in housing, renewing the seawall a different way, setting up a CCO and exploring ways to have a role in the airport um, with the note following the discussion on Thursday that that needs to have appropriate messaging um, and I've got some draft text here for you. Um, changing the uh, proposing changes to the rating system, proceeding. Swimming pool fees, so the introduction of the new um, $1 for spectator and $1 for swimming attending with lane hire, that's not proceeding, so no new fees are being added. Housing for older people, um, so the proposal to increase rates, rentals to cover 80% of costs um, in response to the submissions that we received in discussion on Thursday, the ranges will be adjusted in the revenue and finance policy to allow flexibility as required. Why can I green waste and recycling site closing? Um, the discussion on Thursday resulted in at this stage was retaining service and the cost being added back into the budget. Policies that were out for review are proceeding, including the noted change to the revenue and finance policy. Um, the 21-22 proposed rates increase um, comfortable with what was discussed, but additional work needed to achieve the final rates number after where we landed on Friday, oh, Thursday night um, and exploring other ways to generate income through proceeding with that. Yes? Right, um, no, so this, this is the end of, of that bit. Councillor Randall. what he will say, but what I want him to do, want an explanation. Now many local authorities, I mean, if we carry out these things, we may be, end up employing more staff to carry out some of these functions. So what I want to know is, other local authorities are re-looking at their reorganisation structure. Can I ask the Chief Executive, is he planning to look at the structure of the, um, of the uh, Kippi Coast District Council? I always look at it because I have to respond to what's going on. Um, so if that's what you mean, uh, it's something we always look at. Um, it's not a healthy thing to tinker with structures all the time because it creates uncertainty for staff. Um, so, so you only do it if you have a, a good reason. Yeah, I think what I, I think what you're actually trying to say is um, why don't I cut staff even as we increase our budgets? I, I'm pretty sure that's what you're saying because it's what you say regularly, Councillor. Uh, the answer is no, as I've explained. For this significant work programme, we're increasing our staffing by a, a reasonable amount to deliver it, and that'll be part of the capex cost largely. It's not rates 
um, uh, impost. It's largely within the projects that have been to ramped up to deliver. Uh, anybody else questions? None. Okay. So just to run you through the the draft messaging around the key decisions, um, and just the first point is that it will be referred to in multiple places through the document. Um, so first off, it will be obviously mentioned in the um, contents and what's in the document, um, the introduction to the plan and the Mayor's message and the CE's introduction. Um, so quite a lot in the front part of the long-term plan. Um, and then it will go into detail um, in the section, the overview of our plan. And that's when um, we present the major work that's being done across the community in the first three years. So um, in the overview of our plan section where it goes into a bit more detail, um, it starts off by just talking about the four key decisions. And during consultation, we ask the community for feedback on four significant projects and proposals and following consideration of the submission councillors have agreed to proceed with action on these issues and then it will go through and list each one. Um, I can either read it out for you or if you can read it off the screen, whatever you'd prefer or on your slides in front of you. Oh, it'll just be loaded up now, sorry. I sent it through late, sorry. <laughs> Um, and obviously a lot to take in, so if there is any feedback, it can come later. It doesn't need to be this morning. I think the last sentence is excellent. So shall I read it out? Would that help? Okay. Um, there are significant and well-documented issues with housing access and affordability in Kapiti, and we know this is something many are concerned about. We asked if Council should explore playing a bigger role in addressing this, and a majority of submitters said yes. Council will now look at the options available to us, including the possibility of expanding our role in social housing, how we could influence the supply of affordable housing through things like expanding land supply, incentivising higher density development in suitable areas, or looking at providing increased housing through a partnership with iwi or community housing providers. Council will not be looking to take on development risk, such as being the housing builder. Any issues? Councillor Coates. I'm um, just mindful of any of these discussions have been in PE, but I'm comfortable with how it reads. I just want to test the last sentence around take on development risk because it, it does say such as being a housing builder, but some could argue development means purchasing and developing land. Um, that's development risk. So I just want to make sure what we're saying is what we're doing. It, it's a scenario with a lot of grey, exactly as you say. Um, I, I think it's appropriate for us to be involved in land acquisition and um, setting up the land for um, development. That's, that's our area of specialty, infrastructure, um, and all of the regulatory requirements. Um, and so we've tried to steer clear of saying we won't do any of that. Um, we won't take on um, the construction of the dwellings and all the risk that comes with building and selling those. Um, that is different from saying we m might partner with other organisations who do that though. So, so that's how we would address that kind of area carefully. And if we were going to do anything significant, you'd have to make that call that you were happy that we did that. So we felt that the way to incentivise it is to, is to create the right environment, which can include acquiring land and getting it ready to build and then finding somebody who wants to come in and do the construction on it. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, yes. Sort of. Sorry, I shouldn't have pushed my I'm just wanting. Sorry. I'm just wanting to test it. Like I said, I'm not uncomfortable. I just want to make sure that someone doesn't then say, "You said you are not going to take on any development risk. Yet you've purchased land and developed it. That's development risk." So it's just really around the wording. If everyone else is comfortable with it, but for me, if you buy a be a block of land and subdivide it, develop it and put it in roads and infrastructure, there's development risk there. I absolutely agree um, there's more risk if you start building. No, I take that on board. Um, we're writing this in quite a hurry and drafting it for you. I think we will um, 
We'll look to finesse it a little bit because we need to be quite careful. I don't want to get caught with saying you said you wouldn't or you said you would. Um, uh, all these decisions ultimately will come to you. And I guess there's a lot of we might. Um, so, yes, I, I'm with you that we want to be careful how we word it. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it's it's okay, but I, I don't know that it reflects the submission responses. I've got the page in front of me here, where more people kind of said council support council being an enabler was two hundred and ninety eight, whereas support council involvement in social pension housing was thirty six people. So. I just wonder, I know that up there we're saying when we explore playing a bigger role in, address, uh, in the possibility of expanding our role in social housing, I don't know if that creates an expectation that we're going to deliver social housing, that we're going to consider that. I'm interested in your comments Rob, around that wording. I just, I just think it creates an expectation of something that, that wasn't supported through our submission process. I mean, I, I get, I understand what that means, you know, explore playing a bigger role, but I wonder if that we would be an enabler, that we would work with other people, not that we would build houses and rent them out, you know. So, so that's why we're trying to have the two sentences there, that a bigger role in social housing means how do we work with partners to make sure they're delivering it here? And then it goes on to say, and we don't see us ourselves building houses as being the primary answer. Does that make sense? So it's how you read yeah. it all together. Yeah. Appreciate but, what you're saying. But but on it's it's how you read it all together. But what you say first often has more weight than what you say later. So what we're saying first is we're going to be we're going to have a role in social housing. A lot of people will have a knee jerk reaction to that and not even get to the last sentence where we say we will not be looking on to take development risks risk such so as being provided. Uh, and playing ways we could play a role, you know, or. Um, I think we're giving you some examples of what's been drafted fairly quickly. Yeah. We're really keen to have feedback, but let's not try and okay. write it now. Yeah. Let's take your feedback yeah. and bring it back. This isn't about finalising every sentence at the moment. If that's okay, we'll be a long, long time. Thank <laughs> you. Um, thank you. Through the Mayor, I just want to weigh in on that final sentence too, from the view that I think we shouldn't have it in there because I think it unnecessarily ties our hands going forward. Um, especially in relation to the CCO question, because I know one of the things that, uh, when that got brought up and during the LTP pop-ups, and I was talking to people about some of the different CCOs, one of the ones that kept coming up as something people did support was Urban Plus in the Hutt Valley, and they are a housing developer. And I just think that if we've got that last thing saying that we, we will not look to take on development risks, such as being the housing builder, that may, to some extent, tie hands when it comes to when we have a discussion and a consultation about the CCO, about what some of the options that it could do in there. So, yeah, that's sort of my view. I, I'm generally comfortable with the rest of it. It's just that last sentence, I think, could uh, yeah, cause us some issues down the track if we do want to look at, say, the Urban Plus model going forward. Thank you, Councillor. I mean, you're right. Um, can I say we'll, we'll be a bit in trouble no matter which way we go. If we, if we don't address people's concerns that we're going to get into development risk, they'll be concerned that we're going too far risk-wise. If we say something like this and then we turn around and say, hey, but how about in a CCO? I know we said this, but this is an opportunity. People will hit us with it. Um, all I would say is this is not a policy. This is going to be a document with commentaries and narrative. So uh, I think we need to take on the range of comments and do some tweaking and we'll come back to you to say, does this does this tread a middle ground that everybody's happy with? So that I hear your point and your point, and whilst they're different, they're both totally valid. I, I think it would be useful, um, Chief Executive, if you explain the difference between a policy and commentation, commenting this. Or comment well, don't dry, don't drill too too deeply on this. The, uh, the, the LTP has to tell a narrative mm. as to explain what it is we're doing and not doing. So mm. it does need to be accurate um, and say what we intend, but it's not something where if we said, I know we said that, but actually we've seen this great opportunity, people couldn't literally challenge the one sentence and say on that basis, 
you would have to reconsult everything, if you see what I mean, because we haven't enshrined it as a policy. But we have to be careful in saying that you understand also that it is n nonetheless the key document that's setting our direction, so it needs to be worded well. Thank you. Um, obviously, we all understand this has been drafted quickly. Uh, going to Councillor Compton's point about the final sentence, I do think it could either be fully reduced or at least the second part referring to housing buildings, just so that we're, we're giving us wiggle room to participate in those activities. I think we're trying to clear, send a clear signal that we're not going to become a housing provider. Um, so build houses and rent them out and become a landlord. And perhaps there's an opportunity of, um, of making that clearer rather than trying to reduce our options as, as to how we actually move forward in this area. So, you know, where it says including the possibility of expanding our own in social housing, um, there could perhaps be another part to that sentence which means which means uh, bringing on other social providers. But just, I don't know how to word it because we've only just seen it, but that's my suggestion. And I do understand the CE doesn't want us to write it right now, but I'm trying to give No, no, we're, we're appreciative of the feedback, uh, genuinely, because we want to get these, yeah. these were key questions we asked. We, we do want to get what we write to be reflective of what people thought they were signing up to. The, the reason I was leaning forward to speak is um, just to let you know that on Friday the Mayor and I looked at a development in Wellington where the council does own a building that it rents out at affordable rates. The developer has done all the development and has got a 30 year lease with the council in order to provide security. Um, and so actually your point that we, might, that we won't do that I think is too definitive because just on Friday I saw a solution that was really interesting. If the rental market isn't providing, the council has stepped in and essentially um, has provided certainty to the developer by a long enough lease. Now, I'm not saying we will do that. That would need exploring. But if we said we won't do that, that would be quite definitive, wouldn't it? So once again, for the record, I'm agreeing with the CE. Um, it, and, and, and exactly, yeah, it's every meeting now. So um, uh, I think all councillors are, are agreed that we want to send the signal that we're not about to suddenly become a developer and builder on an immense scale. That's what we're trying to get through, but without limiting our options, uh, because as we know, sometimes you have to provide an exemplar for the community to follow, for other developers to follow. doesn't necessarily mean that we want to suddenly be in that space. So it's very difficult to get that wording exactly right without limiting our future options. Thank you, Mr Chair. So I'm just going back to the actual um, <coughs> questions or comments that um, the community was asked to um, make comment on, and it actually says um, our people have access to suitable housing in Kapiti. And looking at the questions here, there's not a single mention of social housing. I know it includes that, but this here zeroes in on that. And so what people were actually asked to comment on is not actually reflected in that. That's my first point. Um, also, too, um, one of the areas that um, showed very strong support was ensuring infrastructure was developed at the pace of housing, and infrastructure isn't mentioned there either. Okay. Uh, Sixty-seven percent of our document is about infrastructure. So, so, so um, ultimately, it is all about us, you know, and our growth strategy is all about what we're doing there. So, um, hear what you're saying, and we could make comments like that in, in there, um, but it would be a little bit repetitious from other parts of the document. Would be my only response. Uh, yep. Yeah, I just want to say I support what Councillor Holbrook said and Councillor Pravanoff just, just stated, and I think that phrase should be taken out. That's my opinion. Uh, referring back to councillor, the previous councillor's statement, um, we often refer to the housing continuum in the document, and that perhaps is something if we put that phrase back in, then that clearly shows that we're working across the whole, the whole area.
how would we see that it has landed? Because we can go into multiple infinite iterations and it'll take another two weeks. Depends whether you agree with my suggestion or not. <laughs> Pretty limiting, no. Um, so I perhaps I wonder if we put a smaller group together of councillors so that once we've um, reworded it, we can come back and work with a with a particular group to get sign off. Um, because really, in the timeline, you won't see all this again until the whole document comes through for adoption on the twenty fourth. There's limited time for additional briefings and discussions. I think to work around the whole table will be far too onerous, and, and Alison and the team, you know, there's only so many hours left in the night. Um, so we'll do our best to get everything right, give you a chance to have a look at it, um, and if we can agree a subset of people during this morning, that would be one good way mm. forward. If we can't agree it today, that's not critical, as long as we can agree it in the next, you know, by the end of the week, so that we know who we can work with. It's a bit like approving an annual plan or an annual report to have a drafting group, yeah. Um, we'd be grateful for that. It's a bit extra work for those people, so um, well, quite a bit, actually. Um, so just to be clear on that. Um, and it's not that others wouldn't get to see it, but if we can just work closely with a couple of people to, to um, work through any finessing would be helpful. Okay, so the next one is about the seawall. Um, so, since consultation was undertaken with the community for the 2018 to 38 long term plan about the Paikokariki seawall and a plan developed, cost and conditions have, been, have changed, and the previously agreed plan is now unaffordable. For this plan, we will proceed with a like-for-like -like replacement, incorporating improved beach access and artistic elements agreed with the community. Work will commence in the 21-22 year and be staged over five years. Councillor Good. I guess we're trying to... Um mimic the wording that we had in the document, similar to Councillor Pravanov's um, comment earlier. Um, but people were, um, the like for like was the word that sort of rubbed people up the wrong way. Um, sorry, <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. Um, so I'm not too sure, there, there might be a deliberate reason why we've got that like for like in there because it was repeated within the question. Um, but certainly for those in Paikokariki, they didn't like the reference that it was like for like referring what was already there. So I don't know if there's any explanation that, that staff want to provide around that specific part of it. Um, the only other part was the the um, the ideas that came out of the original design, and I think that's covered in terms of the beach access and um, artistic elements, but I'm not too sure whether that was all because I wasn't involved in that process, maybe Janet could provide further in on that particular part. But those were the two points that really stood out. Yeah, they, the like for like, I think we should actually, um, that's more about reflecting the timber option as opposed to like, because it won't be the same because you will have improved access, you will have improved planting you will have a so I think we should potentially one option is to change that to reflect proceeding with the timber alternative as opposed to concrete something like that and you could also then um, in, have a, something that reflects incorporating the key elements from the current concrete proposal such as access planting um, the artistic elements uh, shared path that I think would potentially cover most of it. You might, it may be worth highlighting in there that it won't include the lower walkway potentially, or maybe we, I don't know, I think that's probably enough to say, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sophie. Yeah. yeah, I agree with Sean. I've just, and I can send this through to Alison, but I've just kind of done up something that kind of incorporates that. Um, 
which sets out what the community consultation and seawall design group process brought to the fore. So the key design requirements including protection of the roadway, improved access to the beach, protection of the beach environment and an art and cultural thread throughout the design and then putting something at the end that says something along the lines of these will be retained as a timber wall is developed beginning in 2021, 22 and is staged over five years or something. So then you set out clearly the design features um, and those, those kind of key things that came from the design group process. I think that's an important thing to pull out if, if we're able to um, and the community consultation and then how, it will be re re how that will be retained in the development of a timber wall. But I can send you what I've written if that's right. Right, nobody else? Okay, uh, third one, setting up a council controlled organisation. We will proceed with establishing a CCO for potential fu future use. A CCO can be useful to manage services, leverage opportunities for delivering major projects or hold assets and generate income. They are commonly used throughout New Zealand's council, councils. If and when we had specific activities that we consider could be managed by this CCO, we will undertake a specific community consultation before any action is taken. You can find out more about CCOs at dot dot dot. Councillor Randall. Yeah, I, I asked the Chief Executive right at the beginning if we could vote on some of these things, you know, individually. So I'm very much opposed to a CCO. So do I we are not taking votes as such, and, but we do have an indication, but everybody knows your position. Well, and we don't, we don't do straw votes anymore. We did it last Tuesday. The steer was provided last, last Thursday. Today is just to, re, to bring it back to show you how this all fits together, what was decided by everyone. So um, I, the, the CCO issue, I think, was pretty clear cut. Um, there were some in for and some against, um, but we weren't proposing to relitigate sort of the decisions that were pretty clear. I think what I'm wondering whether we can see is just wording around, um, you know, we heard your concerns. Is that because it, this is a very um, corporate response rather than a personal response in terms of we heard your concerns. When we um, have specific activities that we consider, we will be, you know, coming back to you. And I just don't know if we can, through the wording, refer to the fact that we heard concerns through the feedback that there was conditional support, is what I took from. The responses. Um, conditional yes. <laughs> um, uh, I hear what you're saying. Um, it isn't that that is a response to their concerns. It is that that's what has to happen. So um, it could be it could be something along the lines of to lay any fears about what it might be used for. We have to do this, or we you know we we must you know, whatever. So um, again, um, these are these are, none of these are final and interesting use of language, um, Councillor Coots, because we're aware of that too. We're using two people to draft our documents, and so you, you're seeing a bit of a um, slightly different writing styles, and we have to align those to make them all fit with the style we're trying to do. Um, that's going to happen over the next week or so. Um, so we, you will see um, us trying to soften and, and make that, that more a conversational language. So we're very happy if you point those things out so that we make sure we don't miss them as we go through this. Um, also, in the Mayor's intro and CE intro, well, particularly the Mayor's intro, that gives an opportunity to have a bit more of that, um, a different tone. Yeah. I'd just like to say this is really good wording, and I think it makes it very clear to the community that there are next steps. So I think it's great. Okay, so the last of the four key decisions is around exploring ways for Council to have a role in the airport. The future of the privately owned Kapiti Coast Airport is uncertain. The community has expressed to us that it supports Council exploring ways to have a role in the airport in order to ensure its ongoing operation. 
we will undertake this process of exploring options while building and maintaining dialogue with airport owners and other important stakeholders. This process might identify other available options. Councillor Goods? I'm just waiting for someone else to go. <laughs> I don't want to be first all the time. Um, I'm not sure about this myself, but I just wonder whether we're remiss by not mentioning Hapu or are we involved in that? Because it's like we refer to the airport owners and important stakeholders, but we don't really refer to iwi as so. so I'm not sure I'm not sure myself. I just want to raise it. Yeah, no, it went through my head and, and then the part of the issue is so who? Um, there are a range of hapu, then there is the iwi who we would normally want to talk to who probably haven't been involved. So um, kind of took the cautious approach of leaving all of that out and knowing that it's in a wider conversation but but have the same question mark as you do because it it, it's a fundamental piece of that conversation um, and I just felt that no matter which way we write it it's not going to land exactly right and get into semantics but happy to take thoughts. I'm just wondering because it says in here council exploring ways to have a role in the airport in order to ensure its ongoing operation whether that removes us from exploring a role to have like to have a role in the future of the airport based on the aspirations or the vision of Hapu say so it kind of yeah just interested in why that needs to, or if that needs to be in there, around the specific ensuring that its ongoing operation is maintained? So the, the, what Community had said and why we asked the question was about the airport, mm -hmm. the operating airport, and of course there are so many elements that fit around that. Mm -hmm. um, I probably feel that if we were to in some way say, um, actually the conversation is not about an operating airport, it's about iwi aspirations or hapu aspirations, that wouldn't be the question that we had asked. If it comes up as part of the dialogue, I think we can then, depending on what it throws up, if, for example, it was, um, Hapu don't want to see an airport, they want to see this, and they still want to see council involved, I think there would be a whole different conversation we would then initiate. Yeah. Does that make sense? So uh, I feel that, that um, all of the support and everything else, pe people didn't talk so much about um, the land around the airport and what should or shouldn't happen with it. Um, because that's not really what we asked them to. Some who know more about the whole issue did raise that. So is that a satisfactory answer? Um, thank you. Through the Mayor, I just think it'd be useful to borrow the third paragraph under what we need to consider on page 60 of the consultation document, because that it sort of expands on um, the fact that any decision around it has to be done in conjunction with the private owners. So it's got the line here, because the airport is privately owned, any future role for council could only happen with the airport or with the owner's support. The current owners have engaged with council and have expressed a desire to work collaboratively, collaboratively with us, whatever the future of their asset may be. So something along those lines, including in there, because, um, yeah, just being realistic that there is a, a finite amount of ability we have to influence that outcome for them. So I think just reflecting that reality in there would be useful. I think Councillor Compton has um, covered it all. I was just concerned that if we're exploring ways to have a role in the airport, um, are we trying to suggest that we aren't exploring the other options? Because we've quite clearly gone out and said that it's not our decision in the end. But you know, from my perspective, we should be exploring ways of where the airport stays as it is, where the airport has shrunk or where the airport doesn't exist. Those should be three things that Council are actively working on regardless of where we are in the process. Is it uh, discussion of It is an expression of my interests, which you can refer to as a continuum. Um, my answer to that is um, a little bit like what I said to Councillor Hanford, that we asked the community about the operating airport. We didn't say, and there's all this complexity about what makes it viable but that, that's in the equation. Um, if it is, how do we work with the airport owners on other solutions for that land, that's no different th than the way we interact with any other developer. And we don't put that in our long-term plan and say, developer A wants to develop 100 hectares over here and this is how we're going to work with them. That's just business as usual for us. 
So if what falls out of this are some other things like delivering a whole lot of, say, social housing on some of that land or all of that land, um, that's business as usual for us and, and wouldn't need a special consultation or any other kind of decision making. Any developer that comes to us, we work with them on how to make sure they can get their development happening. Does that answer your it, point? It absolutely does. I'm just, as long as all councillors agree with that position, that should the um, air, airport owners decide that they're not going to run an airport and close it, that we don't then turn to this document and say, well, we've actually got to continue pushing for this rather than accept the position, which is they're the owners and we now need to look at the other options. So I'm, I'm, I totally take your point, but I want to make sure that we don't get caught up on this wording later and then don't start exploring what would be the next logical option. Yeah, again, that's for them, and then they come and talk to us. Um, we wouldn't get caught up? We, uh, we wouldn't. We have a regulatory role. Um, we would no doubt have an infrastructure um, conversation of significance with them and a reserve uh, discussion, just like we do with every developer. So that's going on every day in this organisation too, for, for 10 lot subdivisions and for 1,000 lot subdivisions. Maybe not every day on that scale, but... <laughs> Um, so so I, I believe that that's absolutely fine. That this is simply about if there are ways that, that the council could could work with the owners to see an airport continue to operate, that was the question we asked. If that's not the outcome, that is their the call, and then we move forward from there and see what happens next. Yeah, just a couple of things. I think it's, it's pretty good, and I support our Councillor Compton's suggestion of building on the private ownership aspect. Um, I wonder if the word ensure um, creates an expectation that we're going to be able to. I wonder in order to, I don't know, I don't have to come up with a, an alternative. Uh, and also I think it's important that we mention Hapu. I was thinking maybe we could use the word you know, mindful or something like that, mindful of the interests of Hapu rather than being more specific about what role we would see or... How we're, going to how we're going to ensure that. Uh, through you, Mr Chair. Um, look, I have to say I'm not comfortable with that wording at all with regards to ensure its ongoing operation. Um, we asked here, yes, uh, Council should explore ways to have a role in the airport, uh, and that's moved to um, having a role in the airport to ensure its ongoing operation. Um, that's, to me, sort of a mandate. You know, um, and um, I don't think that's what we received personally. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that wording is, even as uh, Councillor Holborough Hul said, um, it uh, it's almost sets a precedent that that's going to be our aim to keep the airport open, uh, in my opinion, uh, because we're talking about ensuring the ongoing operation. And um, to me, that's, that's something that's beyond our control uh, to a certain point. Um, I think it would be a little bit different if it was a busy airport, but it's not, um, and um, any um, any serious role we have in that airport potentially is going to be very, very expensive. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that wording's too too strong and too uh, directional, in my opinion. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so you know, it is semantics, but in terms of some of those words there, I think it's quite important that we do get this right. So. We've had conversations previously about whether it means all the airport land or whether the airport, and, and when you look at the document, it is very clearly the airport. Um, and the wording it says in the airport to keep the services going. Um, so then the, the second to last sentence, we will undertake this process of exploring options while building and maintenance dialogue will be owner, airport owners. So that's, I'm a bit confused by that statement. And I'm, not, I'm just wondering whether it's actually even necessary. I assume it's talking about the, the buildings that are already there. No, it's talking about talking. <laughs> so it's about saying what? talking with the owners. So um, at, at the moment, um, arguably, we've had limited, uh, as an organisation, we've had limited mandate to engage properly in a dialogue with them. We, obviously, we talk to them, they come and talk to us. Um, but what we've really said to the community is, hey, would you like us to, to set these conversations in a more mandated way to say, is there anything we can do together on, on keeping an airport going? And um, so I think that's exactly what the community said they wanted us to do. Was, uh, and it would be, we felt it would be important to flag that this has to be a 
it's essentially a partnership with them. We have to work together on this, see what see what's what, what's possible, what's not possible, and then go forward from there. Um, I'd have to, <coughs> have to agree with um, Councillor Halliday. The, in the question, there is nothing that actually says about an operational airport. And in the support, um, looking at the public view comments, um, in that top line where it supports, it's important for kapiti, economic asset and transport infrastructure, important for emergencies, general support, um, as long as it's sustainable, doesn't cost ratepayers, and with government, the only thing that talks about operational airport is the opposed area. In the question, it doesn't say anything about an operational airport. I think we have presumed we're talking about an operational airport, but actually the question itself doesn't refer to an operational airport. Um, I guess it talks about an airport, not about airport land, or 110 hectares of land in the middle of the sit of the district. So, okay. so I, I never took it that people didn't think we were talking about an operating airport. So it's an interesting um, mm. observation that you and Councillor Halliday have made. Um, we'll take that away and have a think about it. But yeah. but for me, fundamentally, the question and the, the work that's been done was about: Do you want an airport in this district? And planes flying in and out. All the commentary was about whether they do or don't. Um, would be my take. So, based okay. on your feedback, I'll, I'll take that away and we'll have a think about it if that's okay. Don't forget that the term operational airport includes the ability of the airport to be used for civil emergencies. It's not just commuter services. Yeah, just listening to the comments from the other elected members, I absolutely understand why people have a concern around the word ensure. That's quite a definitive word, so I think that feedback's been taken on board. But reading page 60 and 61 of the document that leads to the questions, there are specific mentions throughout the two pages there around an operational airport. So I think if you go back and read page 60 and 61, you'd be reasonably remiss to not think that those questions mean about an operating airport. It talks about air services, um, the importance um, of um, the, those services to the community. It talks about operating an airport, um, the different options around owning an airport, leasing, and so forth. So I think the, the, the questions itself may not have that specific word about an operating airport, but certainly all of the context that leads into those questions is around an operating airport, and obviously the surrounding lands. It even um, refers to the commercial land opportunities and so forth. So um, I think you could probably find the middle ground in terms of dealing to that word ensure. Um, but for me personally, the, the consultation document definitely referred to an operating airport. Perhaps what's coming out on, on most of these is um, the, we probably need a little bit more in most cases. And we can draw, a couple of times we've heard we can draw a bit more from what was in the consultation document to make sure that the description is a little fuller. Um, perhaps that's what I think I'm hearing about a few items. Um, yeah, just further um, to my colleague's dis um, comments, I would be taking out in order to ensure its ongoing operation. I don't think that was the intent at all, but the rest of it would be okay without that statement. Yeah, I'm um, just agreeing with Prav Councillor Pravano. The word, the word building, I mean, is it, you know, I know the Chief Executive is not talking about actual buildings, but if you apply the Euston Generous Rule on this, of statutory interpretation, it could be, me you know, thought that the word building actually include an actual building, so maybe that word could be changed. Constructing? <laughs> Sorry, little joke. Um, uh, we'll, we'll take the <laughs> constructing, constructing relationships. How about that? <laughs> no, we've heard your comments. We'll, we'll take it away, and, and obviously there'll be drafting going on. So thank you. Um, just one last thought from me, which is that um, in the consultation document on the final bit of page 61, it's got a future consultation on detailed proposal, which says that once we've got 
but if we identified an option we believed would, could work, any future steps would be reliant on da da da. We would consult with the community providing full information. So I was just thinking to be consistent with the do, 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 the CCO one where we talk about, we meant specifically mentioned the consultation in there. I think it'd be useful just to again reflect that in this airport one as well. Right, thanks. Okay, um, so the next set of slides are around um, just the additional information that was requested at the last workshop. Um, so there was a request to find out staff response to the Otaki Museum submission. Um, so there is two million set aside for earthquake strengthening in 29 to 30. Um, and there is no allowance or plan to develop a specific heritage strategy um, in the current long-term plan, or the proposed long-term plan. Um, Otaki CAB, so we had a quick look at the Wellington Community Trust and um, does look like an option, so office can, officers can pass on the information to them to apply for that funding. Um, there was a question around the climate principles and strategic direction and how that fitted in with the long-term plan. So um, a separate report will be coming to Council on that whole area, um, so it's not actually adopted through the long-term plan itself. Um, the climate community education role, the budget for that is included in year two. Um, there was a question asked if we did want to um, put in a cost for a feasibility study for an indoor sports centre for the district. Um, and so we've estimated a cost of $50,000 for that, so it would be 0.07% rates impact in year two or year three. Um, and the last one was around um, clarification for the funding coordinator resource role. Um, so it that role was created to support recovery with a primary purpose to ensure the council and district is well supported to benefit from COVID related funding opportunities. Um, but there is the ability to give um, advice to externals on what types of funding is available, but not actually working alongside them as such. And that was, that was all the points that we took. Yeah, can I just today. ask the, the issue of climate principles and strategic direction? Is it significant enough for it to make a change to the LTP when it lands? I suggest only if we reverse direction. Um, I don't think the actual print... So the, they're founded on a premise that we think climate change is a thing, because you, you, you declared that pretty clearly um, a couple of years ago. These principles are all about implementing um, going forward. So if for some reason the principal said, but we don't believe in adaptation, I think that would be a consultation mm -hmm. item. Um, but all the work that's going on with the um, uh, coastal panel and the associated work, I think all points in the same direction. So, so a long way of saying no, I don't think it, right. so any changes there. Seamless fit. Seamless, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. Council Comp. Um, thank you. Through the Mayor, in terms of the, the Ōtaki Museum submission, the we've got no plan to develop a specific heritage strategy. Is that something that could be added to the work program in the sort of out years of the LTP, beyond the sort of immediate years one to three of it? Um, I don't know if Sasha wants to answer, but there was a response from um, the Library and Arts Heritage, uh, Library and Arts Manager that there is work um, in the future that could be adapted to include it if that was what the council wanted. Perfect. I was just thinking one half of my uh, my academic life was being a, a historian, so it'd be nice to see that sort of heritage in the district recognised. And the other thing is I'll just put a shameless plug in for year two for the indoor sports centre feasibility study, please. Uh, can I just clarify that? There's probably two elements to the heritage strategy. That one was related to a building. And, um, and I think our response around heritage strategies in relation in relation to building was we're more driven by central government policy and in our district plan and what's in there as heritage buildings, whereas the conversation's just been more about um, our, our heritage as an information um, vehicle, if you like, or, or focus. Was it both or either? 
Both? Both. Councillor Hanford. Oh, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, I think the CEO is right. There's that sort of all, a lot of the building stuff's taken care of in terms of um, historic places, trust, and all that, the heritage stuff in the district plan. I guess it's more that that broader thing about the, telling the, the district's heritage and that sort of thing. I, I mean, just referring back to their submission, but that's sort of where I think that broader story could be told a lot better. So. Thank you, Just a question around the Climate Emergency Action Framework, because we consulted, obviously, on those draft principles alongside, or in the long-term plan. Will there be a placeholder kind of in there that notes the feedback that we've had on them, the need to kind of um, better reflect a treaty house model and those have those conversations with EWI moving forward just so there is a placeholder so it's not just like it's disappeared into the abyss and so um, it sets out some kind of timeline for the community too that there'll be a paper in July or around that time <laughs> hopefully <laughs> why, why not next week um, yeah. <laughs> there won't be much in July just, just want to manage expectations there apart from everyone taking a breath um, uh, but, but there's lots of nodding heads, so absolutely is what people are saying in response to your request, yes. Yeah, just would like to agree with Councillor Compton um, about the indoor sports centre should be in year two, um, my preference, or my view, rather than year three. We're looking at year two. Yeah. Yep. Just before we do that, just want to make sure that the other discussion that we've had about looking at facilities across the whole of the region, I'm reading James's mind clearly, um, takes place before this, otherwise we're not going to duck to right? That is absolutely what we said. Uh, by, by not putting it in year one, we've got time to, to progress that to a point where we feel we can go ahead or not. Um, well, let's let's be straight up. In terms of our work program, if if other stuff gets in the way, we wouldn't endorse starting this if we haven't completed that other wider piece of work. Um, and we know the world keeps getting in the way, so I just want to be clear that we put it in year two. If we're not ready to go, we'd be saying to you, we don't want to start it yet. Um, but that's I think what we all understood. So are we clear on that? So year two, given the caveat that the chief executive put on it, Councillor Bravano. Thank you. Um, can I seek some clarity, please? Earlier on, Councillor Randall asked about taking a straw poll, and he wasn't that wasn't able to occur, and we are now. So I'm just wondering if we are taking them as we go through the items, or whether we're doing it at the end or how it's all working. So please. the difference is that was seeking to relitigate something that was decided last week. This was an item where more information was requested. We brought it back to the table, and we were seeking that response mm. from the table. So there is a difference. Yep, you've got a direction. Thanks. Um, so the next slide is covering the additional um, funding requests and where we landed as a result of the discussions on Thursday night. Um, so the $60,000 for um, safety improvements to the access to Paparamo College for cyclists. Um, Ten thousand um, dollars to work with a pro on appropriate projects um, around planning for local community hubs or town centres. So, just to flag that that was in response to the Ramadi Village Business Association submission, but it's not just for Ramadi Village; it's for anything across the district that's appropriate. Um, the rephasing of Namanu to better fit in with when they need additional funding, so fifty thousand into year one. 
um, an additional 50000 for the Social Investment Fund, specifically for the Otaki community, um, an additional 50000 for a youth space in Otaki. Um, so that brings in 0.23% rates increase. Um, adding back in the Waikanae transfer station at a cost of 123,000 adds an additional 0.17 to the rates increase, um, which takes the revised average rates increase to 7.96. Um, and just a note there that if the Waikanae transfer station is to remain in the budget, staff recommendation is that it's through a targeted rate to Waikanae. Right. So that so that's different to what we um, did a straw poll on the other day. We didn't have the targeted rate in there, so I think we need to have another look at that item in the light of that. So that wasn't a very clear decision. Councillor Bruno. So I know that this is. So I agree with um, what Janet has just said. Um, on top of that, there's actually no figures around this here. So providing information, half, um, you know, some information, not a better picture, is actually very, um, it's not particularly useful for councillors. Sorry, I missed, there was no information on. So it suggests here that, that there is a targeted rate for Waikanae, but there's actually no figures around that? Um, so it, it's an um, average cost per rating unit would be $5. So um, through you, Mr Meek. Good morning, everyone. So the figures are $123,000. So what we, what we discussed last week Thursday that by putting it back in that's going to be a cost of 123000 it's OPEX, it's fully rates funded um, so it sits in the rating system so targeted rate just changes what rate it's, it's levied so it's currently in the district wide general rate and a targeted rate would put it into uh, if, if that's the will of the table um, it would put it into the Waikanae community rate all, all wards have a community rate so it's still in the rating system it's still 123,000 there's still an impact on rates so there's no there's no new numbers to bring back um, by putting it back in you're increasing your uh, rates revenue requirement by $123,000 yeah so if it went to a community rate it would um, on average it would increase the um, Waikanae household rates bill by $17 per annum One seven. One seven. Um, just following on from that, so you said that's the average rate. Do you have the range of what that extra amount would be? Because obviously there's been some substantial increases in Waikanae <coughs> on top of what has been proposed um, here. Through Mr. Miller, I don't, I don't have a slide uh, what I've shown you before where we've seen the ranges for the for the Waikanae ward. But the average, the average rates in Waikanae is $4,200 and the team have actually put it through the model. So on average it's a $17 increase for uh, Waikanae residents. But I'm sorry, I don't have the slide where I've, where I've broken it down and highs and lows. I'm just curious to know if there's precedent uh, for funding the waste transfer stations or, or waste facilities through uh, community rates. Um, do Otaki pay to Otaki residents pay to run their services and do the rest of the district pay their own community rates to run the rest of the, the Otahanga? So yeah, gen everyone pays for the wider transfer situation. This is specific to residents around the Waikanae area. As, as councillors will recall, um, all the other transfer stations were closed a long time ago. The only reason this one stayed open was because of safety at the Otahanga round, uh, intersection, which was addressed when the roundabout was installed. And um, so the, the, rash, the rationale for why that stayed open originally has been lost through the mists of time, shall we say, and um, now it doesn't have the same relevance or re rationale for remaining, other than it's a service that the community is used to in Waikanae.
I just just needed to add the um, so the Otaki transfer station and the Otahanga transfer station. There's no cost. Those are operated under um, lease arrangements. So we actually receive revenue from those operators, and um, so there is no rates element um, as such associated with the um, recycling drop-offs at those sites. And yes, so 2008, we closed um, the Kenakena site, there was a site in Paikokariki and there was a site on Rimu Road. Those sites were closed. Waikanae remained open um, at the time. The issue there was access, but there was also at the time Composting New Zealand were contracted by the council to run. So at the time we were paying Composting New Zealand to provide services at Otahanga and at Waikanae. So, um, so both of those situations have changed significantly since then. Sorry, sorry, yes, yeah, uh, James. Um, Okay, so um, thank you, Sean. I uh, was just going to make the point um, that in 2008, when some of those other sites were closed, there was an agreement that the Wike and I one would stay open, and um, this has now changed. Um, so my other question too was, in terms of the survey was that was done, um, could I please have some information around when that was done um, and over what time frame, please? Uh, yeah, I could. Sorry, I can. I need to track down the time frame, but um, I can give you a response, but not right at this moment. I just need to read a couple of emails, and I can provide you with an update. Right, we just park that for the moment. Any other questions? Anybody else on this, James? It's kind of just what Angel's asking me about. Actually, has there been any work done with the existing providers? around whether they would, so I understand that if we were to look at closing it, that there is a desire from the operator there to stay on the site. Is there any desire for them to provide that fuller service in lieu of paying a lease? My gut feeling is that the lease would be a lot less than the cost of transferring waste from one site to the other. So I think I, think I know the answer, but Ange was just kind of asking me it as well around still providing that sort of extended service other than just green waste for the recycling, for example. Um, the Waikanae site. Um, have you thought about extending your services to the rural areas that are obviously growing in the Waikanae area? Because this is, they are the people that we've had a lot of feedback from that they will then have to drive all the way to Utahanga. Um, and whether or not we, yeah, whether we've spoken to those providers, not so much the green waste guy, but um, more so the wheelie bin providers. Sean. Uh, yes, so we have. So um, I'm not sure if there was an email. It was in an email that went out. The, the operators are have made several amendments to their current uh, program routes to incorporate some of those areas on the periphery around the urban zones. So it is something that we are actively talking to them with regard. But I don't believe they would look to extend it as to the full extent of the rural catchments that we have just because of the cost associated with um, you know the, the the numbers that you might be looking at in terms of the handful of properties and the extent of the distance they have to travel to collect recycling but we are actively talking to them about that um, service and um, and there is some movement but I'm not sure if it would be the solution to all of that rural area that doesn't currently have it but it is getting better. Yes, thank you, through you, Mr Chair. 
I just wanted to refer to Councillor Pravanov's statement that um, there was an agreement. I don't know what that agreement looked like or when it was made, I don't have a recollection of it. But if there was an agreement, why would that agreement have been agreed to? What was the reason? Can you, can you please reiterate the reason why? Yeah, but obviously there's a, lot, a lack of understanding around it. Uh, so yeah, I'm not aware of any agreement. Um, certainly, there was a paper that was put up to close the, the sites that were closed at the time, and it was linked to the commencement of curbside recycling. And again, there was um, justification for continuing with Wyke and I because of that issue around uh, access that was that was raised at the time. And um, I guess financially at the time we were we already currently paying for someone to operate that site, so um, I'm not sure how much uh, of an issue the cost was at that time. The other issue then obviously was as well you could uh, dispose of council rubbish bags there at the site, and there was revenue from bag sales as well that was part of that offset in terms of cost. So again, all of those circumstances have significantly changed since since that date and through several iterations, I think in 2013, 2016, uh, we looked to make those changes to um, why can I to close that site, I think in 2013, there was still a concern that the roundabout had just been opened and so there was still a bit of concern around access and um, I can't recall in 2016 where that got to in terms of that process, but not aware of any separate agreement um, or where, or where that would sit or who that agreement would be with in terms of the ongoing operation of that site? So, all I'll add is, um, um, so as you've heard, we're not aware of any um, agreement or contract or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to quote um, former Councillor Cardiff, nothing ever stays the same. And um, when you have arrangements, you've got to look at, so what is different in the world today and um, how might that change the way things are delivered? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> he might not agree with what we're debating, though, in terms of... <laughs> so I'm not going to ask him in the room. Um, but, but I, you know, I do find it fascinating that here we are legislatively obliged to be efficient and effective. And when you bring to the table the views of the community, this is what flies completely in the face of efficient and effective, uh, because the community is asking you to support continuing a service that we are saying quite clearly isn't efficient and effective. It isn't the best use of our rates money. Um, so this is an interesting challenge for you to have to work through, I think, um, because you're very aware of both uh, the, 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 the few kilometres of time savings um, that some people um, will get versus the fact that it is a rates impost that we are saying isn't necessary. Um, so uh, good luck with that challenge. Um, the other thing is, is perhaps we could, somewhat facetiously, we could um, close the transfer station and hire limousines to go to the rural places. It would probably be cheaper. Margaret. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, just to make an observation, I do realise that the um, construction of the roundabout at Otahanga has made a difference, but in terms of road safety, I'd say it's the Wild West, actually. Um, if you're navigating that roundabout, or if people who are in any way fragile are navigating that roundabout, um, to actually ascertain, and I say that because I actually got broadsided there not too long ago, um, because somebody had misjudged the turning circle required of big rigs that come across the rail line and go south at that roundabout. And they're, they're on the increase, not on the decrease. So I know once that the person behind me was so fascinated that he actually ran into me. Um, but I, I think that it is, it is the wild west. I don't think it's a particularly um, safe area at all. And to increase traffic going there, I don't think that's a particularly good move. Councillor Goods. Look, this is a, a totally separate, um, same topic, separate question. Um, through the um, informal discussion we had yesterday, Councillor Elliott had raised... Um, some of the stuff is changing in this space and as, we, as an example we've got zero waste or tacky there doing wood recycling on site and, um, and by making potential changes to the site it could limit that local initiatives that could occur on site so I'm just curious around um, coining um, Councillor Halliday's phrase, just curious around whether um, that could still under different arrangements here still be considered on that site 
if there was a community initiative around waste minimisation. The uh, sorry, Councillor. The uh, I guess that would really depend on the scale of what was proposed there. Um, if you keep the green waste there, which is the current uh, option, then there is potentially some space around where the recycling drop-off containers are that you could you, you could make available for some small-scale recycling. I think anything larger, one of the issues, and this is why we we've talked about Otahunga and the potential there. Larger scale uh, reuse and diversion, uh, generally you need a larger area to, to actually separate waste and if you're doing it on a scale to um, to make a significant difference there. So I, I have to say I would depend on the nature, but if you weren't doing the recycling then that frees up some space for alternative, because I think there's two containers there now that sit along that left hand side as you come in. Um, so if you remove those there would be some space there. On for Elliot. Um, look, thanks, James, for bringing that up. I did want to bring up a, um, equality and the fact that, that taking away the site does um, limit the community's ability to create their own solutions for their own problems, which is a discussion that's huge and been hugely grown that I've growing in the last 10 years, definitely the last five years, as we work regionally towards um, uh, our target of reducing waste by one third per person. And I think it would just be a huge shame if there's one thing I've learned in my seven years as, you know, at working in, in the waste uh, minimisation for council here, is that um, little communities do it best um, when it comes to coming up with their own community solutions for themselves. So on the transport though, um, I, there are a lot of people in Waikanae who are excelling, really elderly people who are excelling at being fully independent and that includes being able to drive themselves around and I do know from the way I've interacted with that community and it's been known for years that, that a lot of them are able to stay contained in Waikanae, do everything they need to do and don't have to go on the highway and they don't want to go on the highway certainly not on the expressway. Um, and I just think it's a real shame that this is a really, really, really regressive move eh, in, um, in, in giving these people choices to reduce their own waste. So I've just sent a photo to councillors and the mayor of what it looks like when a household of four reduces their household waste prop to landfill properly and recycles properly. Now there's five bins there as you can see, each trip to a recycling centre is five bins you know, for, for my household and we're not special, we're not especially perfect at it, but what it does say is that it's, uh, very much that it's usually a dedicated trip and we do that trip twice, that we fill those bins twice a month and our rubbish bin is one simple bag a month, our rubbish bag it costs five bucks to take to landfill. Um, so just showing that it's not as though a family's going to pop their little recycling bin into the back of the, the car and then go to the empty it and then go to the shops and carry on. It's just not like that when you're doing when you're committed to reducing household waste. Um, on that too, our face, uh, social media this morning, the latest householders coming online saying, "Gosh, uh, EnviroWaste have just put up, or some company have just put up my bin cost." charges are going to be up to 420 a month, uh, per annum. Um, panic. Our family pays $72 on average per annum and, and I would like for our pensioners to have the choice to make the same decisions and I would like this very much to stay open as all of the submitters who have, who have commented on this want it. Councillor <coughs> I'd just like to say that in Paikakariki we have incredible waste reduction initiatives despite the lack of a recycling station and the fact is that these people need the people that are using this facility need to dispose of their rubbish so wherever they're disposing of their rubbish whether that's in a neighbour's bin or whether that's at the landfill they can dispose of their recycling at the same time I was quite surprised by the number of people in the survey who are actually batch owners who are using it, they also have an option. They can take their recycling home with them and put it out in their bin in Wellington. 
So, in my, in my view, it seems like we're debating now, so that's what I'm doing. So, in my view, we have a legislative requirement and obligation to be cost effective. Nothing I've heard about this is cost effective. The fact is, we have a recycling station down the road, it's only five minutes more drive, and for the majority of people, only two more kilometres or so. It's just, it just, and, and the reasons why we kept it open in the first place are no longer there. We haven't had an over, uh, overwhelming response from the wider community that they wanted open. A lot of submissions said they didn't know about it. What was it anyway? And the Waikanae community, you wait till you've got somebody who's got, say, a $50 increase because of this, and they don't use it. I mean, that's just not going to be acceptable to them, I don't think, when there's the other option just down the road. So I just really encourage councillors just to consider that nothing stays the same. We're not saying that waste minimisation is important. What we're saying is this might not be the best way and the most cost-effective way to deliver it. I mean, there's no denying our, our, obliga our, our commitment to waste minimisation in this council. The council really has effectively lobbied for that and progressed that over the years. But this is not necessarily the way to do it. Your Worship, um, as an older Waikanae resident, um, I would be pretty grumpy to be charged $17 just to keep it open when I pay for our own uh, waste removal ourselves. I, I know that the gentleman that comes and cuts trees and that at our place takes his waste there and charges me $5 for doing it, and I just wonder how many commercial people actually use that Waikanae uh, centre. I'd be for closing it. Councillor Barano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, so just looking at the demographics of Waikanae, you know, Waikanae is has the whole, oldest demographics in the area, and a lot of those people are actually living um, by themselves. And I've just checked to see uh, when um, GPs have got the ability to put on. Um, a person's driver's licence that they um, are limited to driving within 10 k's of their home. If a person has that limitation on their driver's licence and they live at Waikanae Beach, they cannot drive to Otohanga. Um, so th this is part of, you know, limiting, but basically stopping quite quickly um, what people are able to do and I suppose this is part of the, uh, my concern too is this has happened quite quickly without any education or any um, work done to actually provide people with alternatives. Um, so th that was that part of it. The other part too is um, batch owners, they're actually ratepayers here so they um, th there's nothing wrong with them using that facility. Um, thank you. Councillor Holiday. Uh, thank you. Through you, Mr Mayor, I'd just like to endorse uh, Councillor Hubbard's comments with regards to the um, station. I was quite surprised to hear that it was only $5 for, uh, to put a rubbish bag down in the landfill. I think I might start looking at taking up that option myself, to be honest, because uh, we've cut our uh, waste right down. Um, but um, I'd like to see it centralised you know, uh, with regards to our waste options um, at Otahanga um, because I think we need the next step is to look at those hard to recycle things. And um, so, you know, if, if people are getting the rubbish down to small amounts and they are collecting the recycling once or twice a month going to the recycling station, I don't have an issue around that. Um, I think we need to be looking for different options um, in that recycling space, in that minimisation space. Part of that is. Um, people taking responsibility, looking to neighbours at sharing options now that they're getting less rubbish or less uh, things to put in the bin as well. So um, I, um, yeah, as I said, I'll be supporting Councillor Hubbard's point of view in that. Margaret. Thank you. Through the Chair, if I might make just make a f um, further observation that within the strategy and within the strate uh, strategic documents, resilience um, is a repeated theme and it's a good one. 
um, I would like to suggest that the removal of a service from a community lessens that resilience. I asked um, council staff to give me some information on the range of waste minimization activities that we carry out. Two pages of it. Huge amount of work that we do. I say this because at a previous discussion around this, people were saying, you know, it sends the wrong message. But given the huge amount of work we do around this area, the message that staff are telling us is this is not cost effective. So this is, sounds like a huge subsidy. And I think increasingly the pressure is on individual households to reduce what they use to the extent of only buying the type of stuff that is not packaged and stuff that can, needs to even to be recycled. There's a sort of an individual responsibility around this. And uh, there's a question of equity too. What about all the other areas where people are living in the fringe rural areas? They will demand a similar level of service. We'll be forking out $150,000 around that for each of those areas. So when the staff who are doing a huge amount of work in this area saying this is not cost effective, I think we should give them some acknowledgement that they know what they're talking about. <coughs> Councillor Elliott. Um, look, thanks, um, Niguru. I, I just would like to counter this and just say that um, of course you should listen to staff and of course they're doing so much work that's positive towards reducing waste, so why then put another stumbling block in the front of a whole lot of people, or residents in Waikanae, who are perfectly happy in coping with the system that we've got? I just can't believe that. If it's about money... In a few months, the national the government waste levy is going up 600%. People who put their waste in, uh, take their wa uh, waste to the landfills and the transfer stations are currently paying a $10 levy to, to dump it to the, uh, part of their fees as a $10 levy to the government. It's going up to $60. That funding has been collected by the government to fund waste initiatives and infrastructure right across the country so that this country can reduce our waste. Um, it's, uh, the money is there for our staff. If it's about 123k, it's actually not going to be a big deal in a few months. We, and for, for, for instance, Tauranga City Council have just had a grant for 29, 29 million. And uh, regionally, we're just putting in a grant application for a sorting uh, facility optical sorter for recycling costs $20 million and it's something that the, everyone in the region can use. It's just centralised. You know, there's, there's, there's big money in this, but on the point of the rates and people who don't use this don't, may not want to pay $17 million, uh, $17 a year extra on their rates. Waste systems cost. Reducing waste costs either we're going to be responsible and pay for that and do it properly, or we're not. You know, it's a matter of priorities. And very, very thankful for Margaret for her comment about resilience. That's quite true. And yes, you can listen to staff. They're very expert in this area. But look for, for this whole triennium all I've heard at this table as well, if it's OK with Councillor Elliott, because she's the waste portfolio leader, then it's OK with me. And, you know, I just like staff to, um, my colleagues to remember that. Um, I just feel that I do need to state that our understanding of the government levies and how it's going to be used will not include operating subsidies for councils for waste activity and it, it is going to be used for significant um, national projects only and that's our understanding of how that money we spent and you've given us a couple of examples. Sean, did you want to add something? Sorry, the, the, the levy's going up, I think, yeah, to $60, but over, I think it's five years. So next, from July, it's going up by $10, and then it's $10 a year. So, um, and uh, by 2024, I think, is the date they're looking to have it increase it to 60 But no, and as Wayne said, we, at the moment, we're not allowed to actually use that money to offset operational costs associated with providing services. It's um, 
that's why we use it in our education space and and um, they still haven't clarified how much extra we're going to get from that that's not going to be diverted into this increased capital fund which is the um, the application that you put in through the government to apply for that funding so so yes it's going up it's going up by ten dollars um, a ton and that starts from one July Councillor McCann I turned it off it's too dangerous but um, I, I this has been a, a difficult issue over not a lot of money and I thought the thing that has resonated with me in the last few days was the idea that this was kept open because of the dangerousness of the Otahanga roundabout. As a resident of Otahanga, I use that roundabout every day and I can say that before the expressway and before the roundabout it was dangerous and I think the council of the day must have made a very wise decision because you didn't want to take a car turning uh, right um, and you certainly wouldn't want to take a trailer. But I do disagree with some of the things that I've heard, that it's still dangerous. Um, the traffic is very light uh, for such a big road. It's, I just don't see how it's dangerous. And we've heard a lot about the fragility of people in Waikanae, and it doesn't actually weigh with the evidence that they're still loading trailers. You can't probably be fragile and loading a trailer at the same time. So I understand the need for councillors and everyone else to come up with arguments that that fit with the, the example with the outcome that they want to get, but if my main reason and the reason I voted initially to keep this in was because it sends the wrong signal, what I've learned in the last few days is that actually the reason we took this was because of safety, and that's no longer the case. So I think that's rather undermines. What I would would like to propose is that we do have. Is there any way that we need to put any small amount of funding into um, the signal that we need to send? Is is that a potential? I know that's adding a, another complication right at the end, but I just throw it out there. Sean. So the, the, I guess in response to that, the so as Councillor Elliott's mentioned, the waste levy is going up and we do get a share of that fund and we do invest most of that funding into grants and education and um, waste minimisation activities. So there is certainly an opportunity to look at the next round of funding to, uh, and again, if you recall, we modified the uh, waste levy allocation policy to allow for more flexibility to um, to do staff initiated projects around education and waste minimisation, so there is potentially an opportunity there with with some um, funding that would come through that mechanism to do a bit more in the waste minimisation space. Uh, but other than that, we hadn't uh, we haven't looked at increasing the current allocation of funding in the in the long term plan for that purpose. We have we have something like. 360,000 in next year's capex budget for uh, EVs and charging points. So we've already put that in, it's quite significant. If you wanted to put a bit more in there, that's probably the, the most straightforward way for us to signal something in response. Uh, if it was from an OPEX perspective, I think we have nearly half a million dollars a year being spent in that space now, um, which is um, increasing, but I off the top of my head, I don't know what this year's number is, but as you know, Sean put in place the team over the course of the last 18 months where we have been ramping up that expenditure. That would kind of be, um, it's not that it's not doable, but it obviously would have a rates impact if you were to send a signal that way. But um, if you were to ask how might we send a signal that, that says not only we're serious, but we're more serious, um, I'd suggest looking in the CapEx space and upping that program going a bit further, a bit faster. Councillor McCann. I'm just responding through you, Mr Mayor, to um, the C's suggestions. I, I agree, and my concern has been sending the right signals. So if we do decide not to fund it, then it's ensuring that we explain why it was kept open, which is for safety reasons that are now not relevant, and hopefully councillors might agree to put a little bit more into what uh, the C's just been suggested to send the right signal. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr Chair. So um, 
more education and, and more um, use of EVs is fine, but it doesn't actually solve um, recycling or green waste problems. Councillor Hanford. Yeah, I think this whole corridor is obviously not just about trying to send the right signals, but trying to do the right thing. And that's where it's kind of, um, as Councillor Holbrook has brought up, our responsibility um, as members of, of council. Um, but also then thinking about not just the financial cost of our actions, but actually the environmental, the social cost, the cost to our resilience and all of those things. So um, definitely supportive of what whatever will have the biggest impact in that space and whether that is you know channeling some more money into that capex program of of evs i'm happy to have that explored but i do agree with councillor elliott's points in terms of the importance of because this station is already in waikanae and we're trying to encourage people um to take responsibility for their waste and hopefully we will um, through greater education that comes with increased funding through the waste levy have more opportunities to do that which might then see increase in people using the facility. So I do think it's also about uh, thinking about how it could be used in the future and, and kind of getting ourselves ready for that potentially. So yeah, and a bit of a, a predicament about this one, but I um, obviously don't just want to send the right signals, but want to do um, what will have the biggest impact in terms of waste minimization and emissions reduction. Councillor Hobro. So yeah, I hear all that. The thing for me is that not all the, not all communities have this opportunity. If we're re if we're really serious about this being so important, we should be providing it in other communities too. And actually, Ramati has the has the oldest demographic in the in the district, according to the last census that I saw, which might not be the most up to date one. So why don't we have something like this in Ramati? They're quite far away from Otahanga too. So if we're really going to commit to this, we should be doing it across the district if it's that important you know so to me you know it, 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 we've, we've decided on the way with, that we're delivering this this is very close to the nearest facility we've been told by our staff that this isn't the best way to achieve waste minimization we've been told it's not cost effective so I just don't yeah I, I, I think we should close it Councillor Compton, then Councillor Elliott. I just wanted to uh, through the mayor, briefly comment on one thing. In looking at the 2018 census, uh, Waikanae has pipped Raumati for having the oldest median age in the district by a couple of years. Um, I think it's it's just north of 50 for Waikanae and just south of 50 for Raumati. Um, that was all. <laughs> And somebody just moved in, and, and the person is 102 years old. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that the last um, conversation I had with, with people groups, a uh, group from Pakokariki, they were asking for um, their own trial of uh, rubbish bins with recycling in the three separate bins, colour coded. Um, they were actually asking for more recycling facilities locally for Otaki, uh, for sorry, for Pakokariki. Um, but the other thing is too is that you know if the table is committed to doing this and closing it, would you consider closing it in year three or year two and actually giving the residents of Waikanae who use it, who incidentally is so many uh, contractors who go out there and mow people's lawns and cut people's trees that at four o'clock Friday you can't even get in and out of the green waste portion. Similarly, the recycling uh, drop-off is a bit of a social hub, um, just like it is in Otahanga and just like it is in Otaki. So it's not as though it's not used, it's actually used and enjoyed. But just some thoughts, maybe year two or three to give people a chance, please, to adjust and to set themselves up with bins, the bins that they'll be putting their recycling in from now on. Councillor Bravanov, and look, I seriously need to bring this to a close. Thank you, Mr Chair. So I was actually just going to make the same comment as um, Councillor Elliott, following up on the point that I made that this, this facility was going to be removed, but there was no backup plan. And I would like to, to also reiterate about putting um, some good plans in place um, over the next year, maybe, 
and, and then closing it. Um, so just parking that too, I realise that this is a democratic process and I suppose I'm um, you know, wanting to know what assurities from staff there are for um, helping solve those problems of um, recycling and green waste um, disposal for people in Waikanae who, who really will be struggling with this. That's the first part. The second part is um, about what is going to happen to that land, whether that's um, decisions that will come to the Waikanae Community Board and or this council to make decisions on that. John, can you have a last hit on this before I... I... So the so the currently uh, the, the proposal at the moment is to retain the green waste drop off facility there through a commercial arrangement back through council at no cost to council. So in terms of um, alternatives, that that would remain the um, one of the the things around one of the alternatives. I guess we looked at when we commissioned the curbside recycling and built the transfer station at Otahunga was to put the allowance in there for a reuse facility, the shop that's there, and also to, um, as I said previously, making we're making provisions at the moment for a wider variety of um, opportunities to recycle and reuse at the Otahunga facility. So obviously if, you, if you're going there with your rubbish and you've got the shop and you've got all the alternatives for recycling, it gives you more opportunities to, um, to recycle more material. Uh, the other question was the land. Um, so at the moment, I think there was a question previously about if we did stop recycling there, you would free up some space. Like if there's two container terminals there that you could potentially make available for community-based um, recycling if you chose to. But that would come through to council, I would have thought, in the first instance. And obviously happy to talk to the Waikanae Community Board about any of those proposals as and when something uh, gets to the table. Okay, look, um, let's cut to the chase now. It's been a long discussion. Um, Strong poll, those in favour of removing the service. Can we, just one more time? Five. Those, those wanting to keep it. Five. Five. Right. So that's where it remains. What is your name? No, well, it's, it's a straw poll. So, Mr. Mayor, short budget. You'll have to make a call on it because we can't do both. Well, <laughs> then, then it's a foregone conclusion. I repeat my my straw poll. You voted in favour of closing? Yep. Well, excuse me, straw poll indication. Straw poll indication. Thank you. So we'll be closing it. Mr Mayor, do, do any of the other suggestions of sending that signal <coughs> through allocation, do we come to that? <coughs> So one of the uh, one of the things that we we did do with the um, the upgrade to the charging facilities at the front of this building for EV vehicles was to extend that to future proof that for further vehicles in terms of the fleet. So if you did want to increase that budget by a similar amount in terms of capex, then that would allow us to potentially put another three fleet vehicles. I think that sounds great. <laughs> and I think that if we're, and Jackie might want to comment on this too, but I think if we're serious about not only sending the signal, but actually further progressing what we can do as a council and really um, continuing to set a really, really strong um, and prominent example in the Wellington region, but also in New Zealand in terms of our council's um, emissions reduction and also our target of carbon neutrality by 2025 as an organisation, I think. 
um, anything we can do, because 2025 isn't far away, anything we can do that continues to point us in that direction of hitting that target um, is, is a good step. So I would say that if we're talking about the outcome and wanting to ensure that there's um, this kind of funding allocated towards our environment and you know climate justice and those kinds of things, that that would be a, um, a good way now that we could yeah, commit to continuing to do that. But open to, yeah. I'll I'm you um, thank you for your comments, Sophie, and yes, I will comment that we were doing that anyway. We didn't need to close this um, facility at all. Councillor Good. I guess just going on the comments from Councillor McCann, I think if we were, I mean, I will support um, whatever the table decides around putting anything more into that climate space, but given the comments around those individuals that may have issues with transitioning from this, we had an eco-advisor, whether there could be the similar sort of service just to advise people in terms of what their options are and how to transition um, and looking at those different models and options that, that potentially would be a good area to support. Yeah, I um, I know when we uh, when we moved out of the bag uh, collections and uh, when there were those changes to the recycling collection as well, we did a lot of work there in terms of working with the community on looking at alternatives and um, put a, a fair bit of effort into that so we could look to do something similar as part of this uh, within um, the resources within Ninka's team over the next three months. Sorry, that would be good. And even out of those discussions, it might be working with the operators as well, because you might find there are clusters of people that you could then have discussions with the operators about. Last comment, Council uh, Brabanov, then 10 minute break. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, it's my understanding it's going to close on the 1st of August. So um, I appreciate the work that you might do over the next three months, but it's probably a bit more imminent than that. Just to close off that, we've had a discussion that we might put a little bit more into uh, sending the right signal, but it's very eerie fairy at the moment. And I just noticed it's the comments about closing. We've already, we're not actually closing. I think we need to clarify this. Well, okay, room. one part of it then. Yeah. 